Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst, live here from Zoom. Trump impeachment, the sequel, kicked off today. And if you are like me, you are exasperated, more than fed up with the Trump show. You want it to be over. I want it to be over. Did you catch our great conversation yesterday with the investigative reporter, Michael Isakoff? I'm so ambivalent about this week and this trial. So many of us, just despite the fact that Donald Trump was great for ratings, great for book sales, great for podcast hits, great for everything, we all wanted to be through with the guy, right? Mm -hmm. We all wanted to move on enough of Donald Trump. And here we're going to be spending a full week talking about Donald Trump again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is the last person that I think a lot of us wanted to be talking about or hearing about. Right? We all want to move on. To get going on the vital work of rescuing the country from the ditch that Trump drove us into. We want to pass the stimulus pan, plan. We want to end the pandemic. Uh, we want to raise the minimum wage and enact a green infrastructure plan. There is a lot to do. But here is why we can't look away from this trial. The issue is not just whether Donald Trump is a con man and a fascist. There's no news there at all. The issue is whether we still have a consensus that we settle our differences through honest elections, fair elections. The bill of impeachment charges, Trump will, with with the inciting insurrection to stop Congress from certifying his defeat to Joe Biden. That is a bill that we need to actually go through. The emotional heart of this case is Trump's speech on January 6th and the mayhem that followed at the Capitol. But the importance of this case began weeks earlier, as Isakoff explained. Trump's conduct through the whole thing is horrific. I mean, starting with right after the election and the big lie about the election fraud and, you know, whipping his people up for weeks, you know, about this mythical election fraud and all the evidence they had, and they had nothing. And it's clear that they had nothing that, that um, in any way um, supported what Trump was publicly saying. So he was lying to his followers because he couldn't accept the fact that he lost He just couldn't accept it. So this was for psychological reasons, you know, he pulled off this, you know, incredible fraud on his own people by feeding them um, uh, stuff that just wasn't true. In other words, this trial is about a massive fraud conceived and perpetrated from the Oval Office for the purpose of reversing a fair election. Don't be distracted by the phony issue of this trial being unconstitutional. Republicans don't even believe their own claim. And don't get too wrapped up in the replay of January 6th. The attack on the Capitol was the last awful moment of the worst crime against our political system ever committed by a president. That crime began months before the attack on the Capitol, and it involved the misuse of the presidency to bully local election officials and to propagate a fantastical tale of election fraud with no basis in fact. Like so many big lies, the reality was the exact opposite of what the liar said. The Stop the Steal movement was a brazen attempt to steal an election. George Orwell would have understood if this is acceptable, acceptable behavior by a president, any president, then we have no rules anymore. This one really comes down to Mitch McConnell and his Republican colleagues in the Senate. Do they actually believe in the Constitution and those founding principles you give so much lip service to? Because if you do, you will vote to convict Trump. We know a few Republican senators are ready to do that. Good. Maybe even Mitch McConnell himself. All the experts say, though, that they don't see how 17 Republicans will vote to convict. Here's what I say. If this were a highway bill, 
Mitch McConnell would find those 17 votes. Well, this is more important, arguably, than a highway bill. This is about whether you believe in elections or rule by a white supremacist mob. It's that clear. Do you believe in democracy? Or do you believe that a random mob incited can overturn the democratic values that we stand on? If the Republicans do not find the votes to convict Trump, they are driving a a wedge right into not just their own party, but the values that we stand on. A wedge splitting those who still believe in the democratic process from those who are willing to sacrifice it for their own immediate power. Mitch McConnell, if you don't draw a line and say enough, the right-wing Trump movement will swallow you up. Now, to be honest with you, I couldn't care less if Mitch McConnell is swallowed up by the Trump mob he helped enable. Of course not. But I do care whether our country survives this awful moment, which is why we can't look away from this trial. What Donald Trump did cannot be acceptable, and we must say some something, or we will regret it much later. This is about something much, much bigger than just convicting him, than just finding out where his money comes from. This is much, much, much bigger than proving a political uh, point. This is about whether or not we stand for anything. And if we don't stand for fair elections, then what is this about? What is this all about? So we have an opportunity right now, Me, we meaning those in office, have an opportunity to remind every single moment in this trial why Having rules and oversight matters. Why are we all in this? All right, we have a great show today. We have Judd Legume and Akela Lacey here to talk about the impeachment trial and many more. And when we come back, Thomas Hartman, Tom Hartman, the one and only Tom Hartman, will join us. He is the author of The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Ruling Class. We'll be right back with Tom Hartman. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Wow. Tom Hartman is here. He is, of course, uh, a progressive national and internationally syndicated talk show host. How do you do that? Man, go international. Uh, He is the author of The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Ruling Class. This is a, a recent book in the Hidden History series in the New York Times. Tom, it is such an honor to have you on our our baby little show, the Nomiki Show. Nomiki, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Of course. So, you know, (laughs) having you on uh, the first day of the second impeachment for Donald Trump is quite notable. And the topic of your book is uh, indicative of how how this all loops into the moment, meaning uh, Donald Trump is arguably an oligarch and and he represents the Republican Party, which has been all too friendly to oligarchs throughout our history, as you argue, um, or our country has been friendly. But on the other side, you know, we, we opened up the show talking about how the mob is sort of holding the party hostage, the mob that has has I mean, the mob that, that took control of or tried to take control of the Capitol Uh, in this specific moment. And if they can't stand up to a small group, a mob that an oligarch has used to to take hold of power, then what's the point of all this? I I just want to start off with what's the point of of fighting and having democratic principles uh, and free and fair elections if we can't stand up in these types of moments? 
I think we have to be really clear in our understanding of what's going on right now and how we got here. Um, oligarchy is ruled by the rich for the rich and democracy is ruled by the people for the people. I mean, you know, the, the, the root words, demos and, and oligarchy or whatever it is, you know, it just, you know, clearly imply that if nothing else, but that's the, very much the case. Over the last 20 years, as the, as the Reagan revolution has really bitten into the American uh, political system and, and economic system, uh, as uh, Gillens and Page pointed out in this uh, famous study that was published by Princeton back in 2014 or 2016, prior to the Reagan revolution, typically what people want got made into law. It's how, it's how you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and very, very up until the 80s, you know, we got Medicare and Medicaid and long-term unemployment insurance and child labor laws. Well, that goes back to the 30s and, and food stamps and housing and support and Pell Grants for college, all kinds of things that the average person wanted. Since the Reagan revolution, what the average person wants or even needs so rarely gets made into legislation that they could find no statistical association between public opinion polls on pu public policy and what gets made into law. On the other hand, there, since, since basically 2000, there has been a clear association between what the oligarchs want, the top 1%, and what gets made into law. So that set up Donald Trump. I mean, that, that, the Reagan revolution, the, the, the end point of the Reagan revolution was the logical end point was Donald Trump. Now, so according to them, you know, the metric that you determine whether a country is a democracy or an oligarchy is whether what the people want gets made into law or what the, what the oligarchs want gets made into law. So I think you can build a strong case that we are smack dab in the middle of oligarchy. Well, the problem is oligarchy is a very unstable form of government because it's very unpopular with the majority of the people and rarely lasts more than one generation or 20 years. And typically one of two things happens when an oligarchy is transformed. It is either taken back by the people, by the democracy, as happened in the United States in the 1860s, in our first battle with the Southern oligarchs as the plantations rose up and tried to take over the United States, and has happened in the 1930s when the Industrial Revolution oligarchs, the Carnegies and the, and the Rockefellers of the world, um, tried to uh, kidnap and assassinate Franklin Roosevelt in the so-called businessman's conspiracy, and he just took them to the woodshed. So this is our third confrontation with oligarchy. So those two times we beat back the oligarchs. The other thing that oligarchies do, if they don't flip back into democracy, as we've done twice in our history, is they flip into police states. And we're seeing this in Russia, we're seeing this in Hungary, we're seeing this in Belarus, we're seeing this in, in Egypt and in Turkey and, and in the Philippines, and, and it's growing now in Brazil and, and in uh, Venezuela. I mean, it's just... This is what happens. Oligarchy doesn't stand. It either becomes a police state or it goes back to democracy. Donald Trump was clearly trying to take us in the direction of police state. And what this debate in the, uh, about the impeachment trial of Donald Trump is really all about is whether that police state option is going to stay out there for the next Republican president who wants to serve the interests of the oligarchs may well be an oligarch himself if it's, you know, like a billionaire like Mitt Romney and, and, uh, and use the mechanism of government to, to go in that direction or whether we're going to close the door on that and say never again. If, if, if we're going to look at any of the track records of these lawmakers, uh, whether they're Mitch McConnell, Mitt Romney, or on our side, the Democrats, um, it doesn't look good. I mean, if, if you can't, he, he's, he's probably most likely not going to get convicted. Uh, Mitch McConnell has done very little to, to get the votes that he needs. There are going to be some Republicans like Mitt Romney who might hold the line. But uh, if what happens if there, there's, there's a stalemate? What happens if um, they're lost in this in-between zone, which it seems like our government is really stuck? It's, it's, it's like you say, it's, it's a battle. The, the oligarchs have really won when it comes to... Um, to getting what they want accomplished in in Washington, but the people are the ones who make sure, I mean, if, if we're going to talk about fair elections, make sure that those lawmakers stay there and the oligarchs are doing all they can to misinform, redistrict. We know all the the, the pathways mm -hmm. that they, they use to uh, maintain Washington. power. But I mean, 
if they're just frozen rather than completely siding with the oligarchs, if they're just frozen, the oligarchs still win. I mean, what's the alternative? The weapon that oligarchs typically use when they come to power and in the early stages of uh, making the transition from oligarchy to tyranny. And, uh, and we saw this uh, step by step in Hungary. Victor Orban followed the, the, the same playbook that Mussolini and Hitler and everybody else used, but he did it more recently, taking a fully integrated into the European Union um, uh, democracy, Hungary, and converting it over a 10 year period, about nine year period, into a full blown uh, police state and tyranny. Um, Donald Trump was following that playbook blow, 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 blow by blow, and um, including the, the late stage stuff of turning basically everything that government has some control over the commons over to their private cronies, um, including the media. Uh, Trump did this with uh, the Voice of America and all of our broadcasting all around the world, turned it into Trump media. Um, and, and, uh, and he's got friends who own much of the rest of the media, particularly the talk radio universe. But that said, um, it is it, it, the, the key to the whole thing is money in politics. It, the, this is what I mean, the, the only reason or the main reason that the Republicans in the House and the Senate are continuing to dance to the tune of Donald Trump and always were dancing to that basic tune of we don't give a damn about democracy. We just want what the oligarchs want. We'll bring along a few racists. We'll bring along a few homophobes. We'll bring along the crazies, you know, the abortion, anti-abortion freaks and the gun nuts. We'll bring them along because we've got to get enough people inside the tent to win an election. But really, our agenda is serving the oligarchs. Um, they are doing that because the oligarchs legally can own them. And this is based on two Supreme Court decisions in 76 and 78, Buckley and Bellotti, which said that for the very first time in the history of America, that if an individual oligarch owns a politician, that's not, and, and to the point that that politician would not have that job without the oligarch paying for it, and the politician is passing and proposing legislation that exclusively serves that oligarch. We used to call that bribery and political corruption. The Supreme Court said, no, no, that's free speech. It's protected by the First Amendment. And then in 78, the Bellotti decision, they doubled down and said, we're going to apply that to corporations as well. They tripled down on that in Citizens United in 2010. But when they did that in 76 and 78, that brought this ocean of money into the Reagan uh, campaign and put Ronald Reagan in office and, and, and has sustained the Republican Party for 40 years now. So the first piece of legislation that Nancy Pelosi is getting out of the House of Representatives and that Chuck Schumer is going to try and get out of the Senate, HR1 and SB1, are called For the People Act. And what they will do is try to get around those Supreme Court decisions or openly confront those Supreme Court decisions by re-regulating money in politics. If they can pull that off, and as long as Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema continue to oppose and eliminating the filibuster, they won't be able to. But if we can get these, these two, and maybe there's a few others, but they have come out and publicly said they're in, with, they're in bed with the oligarchs. Uh, Joe Manchin is protecting the coal industry in West Virginia, and he wants to continue, continue to allow a, you know, a filibuster to essentially veto any kind of climate legislation. Kirsten Sinema is in big with the banking and real estate industries in Arizona. As long as they continue to block any effort to end the filibuster, um, that HR1, SB1 is probably dead. If we can convince them to change their minds, maybe with the simple argument that the filibuster has never been used this way, you know, until very recently, that the filibuster was introduced by John C. Calhoun in the 1830s to prevent any discussion of abolition of slavery on the floor of the Senate. The House had actually passed a law against that, against speaking about abolition. In the Senate, it was the filibuster. It was used 100% exclusively to block abolition discussions right up until 1865. And for 99 years, from 1865 to 1964, the filibuster was 100% exclusively used to block civil rights legislation. That's the history of this god-awful Senate rule. And if Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin want to continue to hold that racist piece of anti-democratic legislation in place, um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we well, need to find any of them or something. And but, it's also but, just so amazing to see the juxtaposition of we finally won back the Senate, thanks in large part to 
people of color, communities of color in Georgia who organized independent of the mechanisms that spill money from the top. I mean, they really took the democracy into their own hands and saved our Senate uh, only for two people to use a racist tool <laughs> to block any piece of legislation that uh, doesn't seem fit to them. Um, you, you mentioned the, the stock market crash uh, in, in the late 20s and how there was an autocorrect afterwards, democracy, you know, uh, pushed back against oligarchs. Uh, you mentioned these two bills. I mean, would these two bills take us back to pre-Buckley or pre-Citizens United? I mean, where, where would we go from here? Not entirely, but they take a bite out of them. And, and uh, that's a good start. And, and, and they also make it more difficult for Republicans across the country to suppress the vote in minority communities. I mean, this is, this is the big thing. Yeah, Republicans have known for 40 years that being the party of oligarchs is not going to get them elected. So, you know, they've done basically two things. They reached out to right-wing Christians and, and threw in with the televangelists and the anti-abortion freaks. And, and then, you know, the NRA and the gun nuts when the NRA reinvented itself in 78 uh, from a sportsman's club into, you know, what we know of them as. Um, uh, so, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of work to be done, you know, to, to point that out and, and to take them on, but the, all that good government legislation that passed in 74 and 75 and early 76 after, after the Nixon bribery scandals, um, was struck down or not most of it was struck down in 76 and 78 with these two Supreme court decisions. And then of course they doubled down with citizens United. And then in 2013 in McCutcheon, there was actually, there had been a limit to the number of individual politicians one single billionaire could own. It was just a little over 100. I think it was 130 politicians was the maximum that one billionaire could own. And the McCutcheon decision in 2013 blew up that limit. Now they can own, they can own an entire political party. And they do, by the way. So, uh, you know, we've got some big work to do. And, and I think the most important thing that that your viewers and listeners can do is to call the, the Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. The number for the switchboard at the United States Senate, which will get you right to their offices, is 202-224-3121. And, and call Cinema and Manchin and, and, and also your own two senators, whoever they may be, and say, end the filibuster, let's get something done. There's really more at stake here than even just what you and I have been discussing. The fact of the matter is that the most poisonous, the greatest poison for democracy is cynicism. And if Joe Biden and the Democrats can't start doing the stuff that America wants, in other words, can't start behaving like a democracy, if they're blocked at every turn, as was Obama, as was Clinton, then the cynicism is going to grow. The Republicans are going to come back in 2022 and 24 and say, hey, those Democrats made big, big promises, but they didn't give you squat. Just elect us. We'll do that. Don't forget, Donald Trump ran on a campaign of raising taxes on rich people, giving everybody in the country universal health care at a lower cost than Obamacare, and bringing the 65,000 factories that were shipped overseas as a result of the, the uh, negotiations, the trade negotiations that were negotiated by Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush, bringing those factories back. He lied about all those things through his teeth. But people voted for him because, hey, who wouldn't vote for those things? Right. And the Republicans will come back and they'll have a whole brand new set of lies. And then once they get into office, it'll be just the same old, same old. We've got to stop the filibuster so that the Democrats can actually accomplish something. If we can't prove to the American people that democracy works, they're going to abandon democracy and they're going to embrace strong man dictatorship. I mean, it, it seems like some have already done so. I, seven, seven million. Seven million, exactly. And, you know, you, you look at 2000 eight through 10, uh, there was this, this moment where Obama could pass a lot. He, he obviously, we, the Democrats at the Senate and Congress and the White House. Um, why didn't they prioritize the filibuster then? I know, you know, he was, he was focused on some key issues. Lily led better act was, was great achievement. Obviously Obamacare sucked the life out of, uh, anything else in Washington, even after Obama left. Um, but why wasn't the filibuster, you know, at the top of the slate then, if it yeah. could affect so much? Well, and, and back then it, it could have, it was being applied to judges, federal judges and the Supreme Court as well. 
Um, they didn't because they could see the handwriting on the wall. I mean, uh, Barack Obama was president, had a, had a veto-proof Congress for 74 days out of the entire eight years that he was president. And, you know, between Ted Kennedy dying and Scott Brown coming in and all this kind of stuff, there was a little 74-day window in which they were able to pass, as you said, the Lilly Ledbetter Act, uh, Obamacare. They passed about two dozen really consequential pieces of legislation in that little tiny window of time. And then the Republicans came back with their, with their power of veto. So I, I don't think it would have been possible. And so they chose to spend their political capital on things they could actually get done. But right now, I think it is possible. Uh, it only takes a simple majority. It takes 51 votes to change the Senate rules. Um, I'm not certain whether we would need one Republican or whether uh, uh, the vice president, Kamala oh, Harris, right. can, can break that tie. I believe she can on the Senate rules because she is the president of the Senate. That's her official job in the Constitution. Um, she, has a, she has both Article I duties, both Article II, the executive branch, and Article I duties. And in fact, Dick Cheney tried to argue that his principal job was Article I, and therefore he couldn't be held accountable under <laughs> provisions in Article II. So um, I'm pretty sure that she can, she can be the, the, the tie-breaking vote. So we've got to get uh, Cinema and Mansion on board and, uh, you know, or this country, our democracy. I mean, this isn't about Democrats winning their agenda. This is about whether we are going to go from the oligarchy that we are right now into full-blown tyranny or whether we're going to go back to democracy. Um, how, what is the timeline? I mean, this is, I, I, we have to obviously move cinema and mansion, but what is the likely timeline? Uh, and also, I mean, let, keep in mind, uh, my senator is Chuck Schumer. I, I'll be calling Chuck Schumer's office and saying, what kind of leader are you if you can't move your own senators? Uh, you know, we have to apply the pressure to right. who And, and who Kirsten Gillibrand. Too. And Kirsten Gillibrand, too. Yes, of course. But especially Chuck Schumer. I mean, he, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's his Senate. So what is the timeline looking like? Well, it's got to be done as, as quickly as possible because there's a lot of really good legislation that has to be passed. Um, uh, I think the political timeline is probably four to six months at the very most that we could even consider doing things like this. Because after that, the primary season begins and everything just kind of gets thrown up into the air. So we've got this. And, and, you know, it's the same thing in 2009 with Obamacare. So we've got to get this done and we've got to get it done now. So folks can get relief and then we can get to the bigger stuff like breaking yeah. up uh, monopolies and taking yes. on big media companies who have yes. uh, affected our democracy, which you write about in your book as well. Yeah. How likely do you think, I mean, if, if, if we end the filibuster, uh, how likely do you think Democrats are willing to take on media? I don't know. I, I really that's, don't know. That's how crazy this is, is. These are conversations we've have been having for years and because we haven't even gotten it on the table, uh, it seems so foreign and, and the challenge that we have is, is, you know, what I what I mentioned before that we've got we know of two. Uh, there's probably more like 10 uh, Democratic senators who are deeply in the pockets of individual industries. And that's how they got there. And that's how they stay there. And uh, so they're not always going to vote in favor of democracy because it'll work to their detriment, to their personal political de detriment, which is a real tragedy. And we need to be calling them out. We need, a, you know, the left wing version of a Lincoln project calling some of these folks out. Um, I've been very reluctant to engage in the circular firing squad, particularly with regard to the Biden administration at this point. But at some point, we're going to have to start identifying Democrats who, frankly, uh, should go the way that Joe Crowley went. Sounds like a plan to me. Well, there is a new pack out there uh, called the No Excuses Pack that was founded yep. by the co-founders of Justice Democrats, which, you know, they're out there targeting Mansion and Cinema. We had uh, Corbin Trent on last week discussing that. Good on you. <laughs> well, the little that we can do. Uh, Tom Hartman, such a pleasure having you on. Go check out Tom's new book. Uh, it is, it is, so this is part of the New York Times. Explain this a little bit more. They have a hidden history series. Yeah, I'm, I, it, it, the, my, the association with the New York Times is just that I've been on the New York Times bestseller list. But this, this, oh, book, got it. Okay. So this is the fifth, I think, in the series of books called The Hidden History. We did um, uh, guns and the Supreme Court and monopolies and the war on voting. And now we've got the one on, on uh, uh, 
yeah, and now we've got the one on, uh, what do you call it, uh, oligarchy. <laughs> Oligarchs, yes, the thing that's controlling Sorry. us. Check out the hidden history of American oligarchy, reclaiming our democracy from the ruling class. What timing for that on the day of the second impeachment of Donald Trump? Great conversation. Hope to have you back on again very soon. Tom Hartman, thank you. Thank you so much, Namiki. It's been great talking with you. Wonderful. Take care. All right, we will be right back with Akela Lacey and Judd Lagum to talk about today's news. Uh, Ooh, it's going to get spicy. Sometimes the news gods just throw us something that aligns with our guests. We don't always plan it. Sometimes it works out perfectly. Uh, But uh, I'm excited about this one. I'm going to give you a little teaser. It has to do with someone on the panel's old boss. Oof, that's in the news today. Uh, Meanwhile, if you did not see, uh, I went live yesterday, sort of an impromptu live with our friend, uh, Michael Sikoff, who's a longtime investigative reporter. He's now over at Yahoo News. We talked about the impeachment because he's been covering uh, the impeachment for a while. He's been covering Trump's relations with foreign governments, potentially, and special interests. Uh, He's always super interesting to talk to. Great investigative reporter, um, does not hold punches. If you can check that out, I think it's on our live right now, but we have it up from yesterday on our YouTube page, and we'll be releasing the interview uh, exclusively to patrons very soon. There you go. So thank you to everybody who's already viewed that. You can go check it out right now on YouTube. We will be right back. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, if you are not already part of our book club, did you know about our book club? We launched it in January. It's been so much fun. I spend every waking moment reading because <laughs> I signed up for the book club. We have three different levels. There's a level where it's one book a month. There's a level where it's two books a month. And then there's the crazy people like myself who sign up for four books a month. And in February, we are uh, launching the book club series with our friend Josh Fox, who has a book called The Truth Has Changed. The Truth Has Changed uh, is a book version of his one man show that he did a couple of years ago about how our 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 identification of the truth is being muddled and commoditized and uh and, and it's, it's almost like uh, there's a magical way of how truth is being illustrated in the press. Uh, he talks about Bannon a lot, so I think that'll help you understand it. But it was a one-man show that he did. To me, it feels like for years because I saw so many versions of it. But uh, he took it on the road, and now it's a film. So it came out just now as a film as well. So you can have the book. You can watch it. As a film, you can't watch it as a one-man show in person anymore because that's the art and the magic of theater. But go to uh, patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Not only do we send you the book, but then you get an exclusive conversation with the author and myself uh, for this book in particular. And uh, we just launched a partnership with Verso Books. So we will be uh, releasing our schedule very soon of Verso Books that members of the book club will get in the mail. You don't have to go buy it. You get it as part of your program and you get the interview and then you can send us questions. Send us questions over at the Nomi Key Show at gmail.com. All right. Let the panel commence. It is a Tuesday, also known as my Monday. Uh, first up, first time ever, we have Judd Lagum, who, oh, there you go. He's connecting his audio right now. 
Judd is the writer of Popular Information, uh, is a newsletter. He is a journalist. He's a lawyer. I didn't know that. Also a former political staffer. He founded in 2005. What a day to talk about this. Think Progress. He was the site's editor-in-chief. Uh, and then later in 2018, he founded Popular Information. And we have Akela Lacey, who is a politics reporter over at The Intercept. Welcome back, Akela. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks for having me. All Thanks. right. I would be a very bad internet show host if I did not talk about uh, your former boss, Nira Tand, and I'm so sorry, Judd, if I'm putting you in a position, but she is one of the stories today, and it's just sometimes the news people, you know, it all comes together. Uh, Nira Tandon is, of course, the she's being nominated to head up the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, she is the current, I believe, president of CAP, still Center for American Progress. Um, let's roll that clip real quick of, of Nira on Social Security. Candidates uh, with these governors. Uh, and I think that there's other, you know, there are progressive governors like O'Malley and Cuomo who've taken a much more balanced approach on, on budgets where they've looked at taxes as well as reforming programs and, and cutting programs. And so I think that's that's the approach the American people are supporting. There's a viewer here who wants you to take us deeper into entitlements mm-hmm. uh, by Twitter. Ms. Tanda, do you know what the president means when he says entitlements are on the table? Any specifics and anything you would endorse? Yeah, I mean, so there are a range of entitlements um, that, you know, I think when we're talking about entitlements, we're talking about Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. These are programs that um, that uh, people receive support because of the status that they have. So when after 65, you get funding from Social Security and Medicare. Um, actually, it's grown, it's going getting older for Social Security. But uh, and you know the president has 300 billion dollars in his budget in cuts in Medicare. Um, that comes on top of cha- cuts in Medicare from um, the Affordable Care Act. So he has put specific cuts in the budget already in Medicare. Um, and they had savings in Medicaid in the past. Um, I think the question really is, if we're going to have a deal to address long-term deficit reduction, we need to put both entitlements on the table as well as taxes. It's unfair to ask only middle-class Americans to bear okay. the burden of our deficits. Middle-class Americans actually didn't create the deficits. So, um, so, <laughs> so obviously this is this is not current. This is uh, not reflective of maybe even her current beliefs or Cap's current beliefs. But uh, if we are going to judge what type of OMB director she would be, um, we have to work with what we have available. Judd, you were over at Think Progress. Uh, I mean, can you imagine this being something that this this being the frame of mind she's in today uh, and she would take to the OMB? Uh, I don't really know what her, what her frame of mind is right now. As I, as you mentioned, I've been writing this newsletter for the last you know two three years, uh, and not working at the Center for American Progress. But I, I do think there's been a a broader shift uh, through the whole Democratic Party. You know, Biden himself um, talked about these kinds of cuts much more freely and sort of backed away from them in the course of a Democratic primary, because that that's reflecting the current politics, which has, has moved to the left. It used to be, you know, Howard Dean used to be the, you know, when I first started getting involved in politics in 2000 or so, you know, Howard Dean was the left. And if you look at Howard Dean's views today, you know, they're probably center right, rightish of the Democratic Party. So, you know, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, but I, I do think that the Biden administration as a whole is probably unlikely to go down that route. I don't I don't think they could even get it through through Congress uh, at, at this point. I think that Republicans would be even afraid of taking that vote. And it would yep. be very hard to, to illustrate that to their voters um, in this economy. Uh, Akela, I still can't get over this choice, though. I'm sorry. Maybe it's just too personal and <laughs> too many back and forth with her on Twitter. But I, I just feel like the Biden, I mean, is it is it a way to like take Cap's policies into the OMB or is it a way to like take her out of the public space? I can't understand why. I mean, I, I kind of think that this pick was something that 
the Biden team thought would be kind of like a giveaway to progressives and to the left, which of course it certainly is on a lot of levels, but there are a lot of, it, you know, it, it's telling that um, they didn't think that some of the criticisms that people had about, about Nira and, and her tenure at CAP would be, would, would, you know, overshadow some of that. I mean, some of the, beyond just the social security cut stuff, I mean, we've reported on some of the, the other things that, that she was involved with in CAP as far as like having, you know, pushing writers not to be anti-Israel in response to, you know, criticism from APAC um, and, and other things kind of in that nature. And so I think there's, you know, people who don't, look too deeply into the picks, like might might be excited about this. But obviously, there were a lot of people who who threw up their hands when this came out and were like, okay, well, you know, we could either be we could either be fighting over crumbs and, and fighting over over whether or not progressives get get any sort of representation representation in the administration at all. Or we could we could, you know, go into the nitty gritty and find something. I mean, you could find something wrong with any any person that they put up. Right. But um, I think there's part part of this is that, you know, there's some people in the administration who think that that the left should be very happy about this. And obviously, um that's kind of ignoring, you know, the record that that's public record for a lot of a lot of reasons that that people have criticisms of her. Um, but and then there's it, just tone it doesn't deaf make a lot too. of sense. Yeah, whether or not it's okay, you could say there's progress in the name of cap or whatever. Like that, that's one conversation. But it's another thing to say like this is somebody who's had and she admitted this when she went on the stand today. Um, and 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 she said, you know, I I I I'm summarizing and I don't have the clip ready for us, but uh, I regret some of the things that I've said online, uh, people, I understand that people are concerned and, you know, I'm sorry for that or something like when really it's about the tone. And I, I, that's why I'm just like the political nature of this choice just seems very off. A lot of people could be in that position, the same stuff accomplished, whatever their agenda is. Um, but given how she plays on Twitter and other places, um, offline staffers, et cetera, uh, it just seems like a very strange choice, especially with the Republicans likely to to throw this in her face. I mean, do you guys have any final thoughts on this before we do the Nero wrap? <laughs> I mean, I think like some of the tweets that they were criticizing her over were like things that are not very controversial. Like, I mean, talking about Republic, like, you know, calling Ted Cruz a, a, a the devil. I don't, I, I don't exactly remember. I, that's not what she said. But like, there's a lot of people in in real life who would agree with some of the things that she has said. And so I think when we're talking about tone for like, you know, for a, a political appointee, um, I, I mean, I think there's some gendered aspects to this too. Obviously, Nira is like a very well-known personality on Twitter. So that's going to come up, but I think it's kind of just like a false equivalence at a certain point when you, when you're looking at some of the other people that have come through these hearings, you know, in the last four years, I, I don't, I think it's more of a policy issue from, from my perspective, but yeah. So does, does Twitter, uh, are we just, is this suddenly something that we have to take into consideration with all appointees, you know, someone's Twitter, Twitter legacy? I think we'll probably hear more in the future. You know, I don't know how many people, you know, Nero was sort of of Twitter, I think, more than some of the other people who have Twitter accounts, you know, and use it in a very kind of staid way. Um, I think Nero is probably one of the first cabinet picks who, you know, picks fights with people on Twitter. And then, then you're sort of seeing that. I think it was probably likely had Georgia not gone the Democrats way that Nero would have you know, quite likely not made it through the Senate, because I think the Republicans are looking for, you know, at least one, maybe two people to reject to show that they're kind of standing up to the Biden administration. It seemed like Nero would probably be the one. Uh, but now, you know, I, I would imagine she she gets through because she, she probably can can peel off a few Republican votes and she doesn't even need them. So and, and I bet the, and I bet all the Democrats will end up voting for her. And the awkwardness from Bernie Sanders. That's all I got to say there. All right. In great news, uh, hopefully, Amazon workers are organizing. Uh, they've they've been organizing in Alabama. Uh, let's roll that clip of, of what started just yesterday. Voting begins for thousands of Amazon workers in the state of Alabama. They'll decide whether their warehouse will be the tech giant's first unionized facility in the United States. All right, Hillary Vaughn from our Fox Business Network, our sister network, joins us now with more. Hillary. 
Good morning, Steve Ainsley and Brian. This is Amazon's biggest labor battle in U.S. history on its soil. Those ballots go out today to Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama. They will have seven weeks to decide if they want the retail, wholesale, and department store union to represent them. And if they do, they would be the first Amazon warehouse in the U.S. to unionize. And the move could spark a wave of unionization for other Amazon warehouses around the country. Workers fighting to join the union say they face grueling production production quotas, and they want more input into the workplace, uh, the union president told NPR. Amazon has gone on an aggressive counter campaign discouraging workers from joining, uh, voting to join the union, even placing flyers in their bathroom stalls. And an Amazon spokesperson says that they offer their workers better pay and benefits than even their competitors. Workers there make over 15 bucks an hour. They get health care, vision, dental, and a retirement plan. Pro-union workers, though, are getting high-profile support here in Washington. Washington. The union pre president says he talked with the White House uh, about their campaign, and the union also got some support from Senator Bernie Sanders, who sent pizza to workers who rallied over the weekend. And he also tweeted this, it cannot be overstated how powerful it will be if Amazon workers in Alabama vote to form a union. They are taking on powerful anti-union forces in a strong anti-union state, but their victory will benefit every worker in America. The voting ends in mid-March, and the votes are happening by mail, but Amazon did push for in-person voting. They were concerned that mail-in voting would mean that there is lower turnout and possibly fraud. Steve Ainsley and Brian. <laughs> okay, but I, I love about this clip. And normally we don't pull other reports, but I just wanted to see how Fox Business was like framing this entire thing. Like, oh, they pay their workers fifteen dollars an hour and voter fraud. I mean, it's an amazing collection of different things. But um, ultimately, I. I, I it's indicative clearly of a rising union movement that's happening and organizers on the ground. And um, I actually expected them to lose their minds a little bit more than that. Kayla, you're, 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 I'm sure you're covering it over at the intercept. What's uh, uh <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting because now we're at the stage where, you know, Biden is, is being pushed on the $15 minimum wage. And like, this is not that, you know, luckily we're in a day where this isn't that crazy of a conversation anymore. So I, I, I also would have expected Fox business to be a little bit more alarmed at that, but I mean, the context here is that, you know, Amazon has been surveilling workers that have been trying to unionize and that they, you know, they fired a worker just in the spring who who raised concerns and tried to lead a strike over coronavirus concerns. They fired another guy, you know, in 2019 who had been trying to unionize. So um, all of this is is well and good, but it's um, it's not, you know, it's not without casualties. And I don't think that we're going to see the end of this, this you know, this conversation. And, um, I don't, I don't know. I'm curious also, you know, what the role, what the, the, what role Jeff Bezos kind of stepping down to executive chair has to do with this timing. Um, I, I don't know anything about the connections there and like whether him stepping down actually means anything for, for, you know, decreasing his control over the company. I suspect that it doesn't really. Um, but I, I am curious about, about how those things overlap too. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that usually the, the strategy, uh, that they, they get rid of the guy when it's a little bit too controversial, but he's still running the show from the board. Or, I mean, I read that Jeff, that uh, Steve Jobs book. That's what they did to him, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> no, same boss. They just, you know, put another figurehead in. Um, Judd, uh, you know, they, they what's, Akela mentioned that, you know, Chris Smalls, uh, who is in Staten Island, who is organizing, uh, was fired. You know, he has now become a, a major uh, leader in in amplifying the voices of other, not just Amazon workers, but or workers who have not been protected across this country in the middle of a pandemic. I guess my, my question about this is, why isn't the administration prioritizing these types of, this type of organizing more? I mean, I personally, and, and you're reporting on this, so I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I personally am shocked about how little helping frontline workers is centered right now in this moment after so many people hashtagged frontline workers, thanked frontline workers, created commercials over frontline loop workers, showed them in their, uh, in, in, in their conventions yet. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, that is absolutely true. And one of the things that, you know, I've been looking at over the last year is how a lot of these workers have been treated, you know, places like Amazon, a lot of the big supermarkets like Kroger, and you know this has been a huge year for Amazon. Um, 
Um, Jeff Bezos as well has exploded and just the amount and, and all these Amazon workers are putting their lives at risk because they're indoors in these warehouses for extended periods of time. Um, they, they have better equipment now than they did in the beginning, but in the beginning they had, um, you know, very insufficient protective equipment. And, you know, I think that this could be a, a union could help, especially in a situation like that. It's not just wages, it's also their working conditions. I know that a lot of the workers at that particular facility are talking about how how little time they have how much how little time they have for breaks um you know over the course of a very long shift so that's another thing a union uh can do for you uh but it's, it's but, egregious actually but i think but i think the reason why and I, I kind of went to the amazon website yesterday and they have an extremely aggressive anti-union campaign going on including pulling people off of their ships into mandatory, essentially anti-union message meetings, because they recognize that if a union gets in place in one warehouse and they do see conditions improve in that warehouse, then it's gonna be warehouse after warehouse after warehouse. And pretty soon you're gonna have, you know, the bulk of your 800,000, you know, employees unionized. So that's why there's such an aggressive, um, aggressive effort uh, being undertaken by Amazon. And they can't outsource because all of these uh, Amazon strategies are about, you know, getting something to you in time, like in an hour or 24 hours or whatever their latest uh, project is. So it's, it, it, they're really forced into a corner if this unionizing does uh, deem a success. Um, it's impeachment day again, <laughs> round two. <laughs> I, I mean, this is just like, okay, so we've talked a lot about impeachment on the show so far, but I'm, I'm sure we're all exhausted talking about Trump uh, and we want to focus on the important uh, slate of, of issues and, and policies that we need passed immediately. With that being said, there, the, the discussion today is over whether or not it's constitutional. And I, let's play that clip really quick of Representative Clark and her response. So, I mean, sorry to be stuck on this point, but that sounds like no witnesses, just so we're clear. I, I leave it up to the to the managers. Uh, they are very capable on whether they will see the need. But I think this is a highly unusual impeachment proceeding and that the jurors were also witnesses. Those senators knew what it was like to flee in terror from the Senate chambers when they heard that mob at the door. They saw the flags of the Confederacy being flown. They saw. So, I mean. Listen, I understand that they want to move on and, you know, it's, but why not? Why not fight over this? If we're not going to fight over a coup incited by a, a president, then what's the point of, of protecting our democracy? Okay, Kayla. <laughs> Anybody can drive in. It's, it's... I mean, yeah, I just, I don't think that Democrats have the willpower to to continue fighting over this. I think like they're very wary. I, I mean, it's it's like a me it's a messaging game. Like Republicans have the messaging on this down. They have, you know, it's it, they have an easy talking point to say like, why are you wasting time on this? We're still in a pandemic. The president isn't in office anymore, um, which I think is part of the reason why a Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and, and some of her colleagues, you know, they had this special hearing last week to talk to like bring this back into the, into the public conscience and remind people like, yeah, this happened and like we haven't done anything about it yet. Um, but unfortunately, that's not where, you know, the minds of, of the Democratic Party, the leaders are right now. Like they're still fighting over the the amount of stimulus checks that they want to give out. They're fighting over, um, you know, you know, timing for for removing U.S. attorneys, and 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 they're not. This is not like what what they want to be doing with their time. So I think that's that's part of why they they don't want to fight for it. Um, also, you know, they voted down um, the the option to call witnesses. I believe that was like earlier this week or last week, and um, Judge probably can speak to this more because I I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know if that leaves any room for them to to add them later later in the trial. But um it just seems like, you know, they're fighting a very much an uphill battle, even though they have control right now, which has been the problem uh, you know, for for a very long time. But yeah. I you mean know, what's strange to me is okay, fine. You, you and maybe Judd, you have more knowledge of this. If you can't if you don't want to call uh, members of Congress or Senate uh, to be witnesses because they're also the jurors in this trial. Then how about calling 
the uh, the those who were on shift, whether they were uh, frontline workers going to the scene, which has kind of been left out, you know, those who who came and responded, the first responders, um, of course, the security guards and the police. What about the families of the victims? Or I don't know, 10 million people who are watching it live on air. I mean, it, it just seems like like they're the only witnesses that they can bring with yeah, there, there is going to be there is going to be a vote per the resolution that they passed at some point uh, early on in the trial. The first vote is going to be on the constitutionality issue. Then they're going to have a vote on, af- I believe, after the two essentially opening statements uh, about whether they want to have witnesses. If you remember, this came up in the first impeachment trial as well. There was this issue about whether they had wit- witnesses at that time. The Democrats really wanted to put on witnesses, but they, they couldn't get enough votes um, for witnesses. This time, I think the reality is they don't want witnesses because you see that Biden and the entire White House will not talk about this impeachment trial um, at all. And they want to move on to the next one because they I think the calculus is they don't think they're going to have Um, they don't think they're going to have the votes. The witnesses that I'd like to hear from, actually, I think the real key is what was Trump's state of mind? Because in their briefs, they're saying, oh, when Trump saw the violence, he was uh, horrified and he immediately wanted to do everything he could to protect it. They claimed that the White House, you know, took all in their brief, they claimed the White House took all these actions immediately to try to secure the Capitol building. So you could call people who were talking to him and who were involved in those planning to see, because there's a bunch of reporting that says actually he had the opposite reaction and was really quite thrilled to see what was going on. That's reflected in his tweets as well. So I think there could be some interesting witness testimony that I personally would like to see, but I just think all the signals were were seen um, from the members of Congress and from the White House is that there's no appetite for it um, because they want to, I think, get back to the COVID relief bill, which which I understand, but we're now kind of getting like half a loaf um, because we're not going to get the the full presentation that we could if you did have, you know, even a handful of witnesses. Um, yeah, they could call former Vice President Mike Pence. Be very curious to hear what his state of mind was and what he went through when he was uh, taken out of the Senate or wherever he was put into security. Um, I guess my last question regarding this is if if we're not going to have the votes to uh, to convict him, um, we're not going to call witnesses, then what can we do? What can government do right now to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again? You know, everything from throw out an idea, you know, breaking up uh, media monopolies or these platforms. I mean, what what can we do that'll prevent this? Okay, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because I think, you know, news cycles are just kind of running away from us now. And there's so much reporting that still hasn't been done. On, and, and like, you know, hopefully more of this will come out. But I think like media has an obligation to try to keep, you know, push back on on the the tendency to just you know move forward and run away with this because there is so much stuff you know whether it's uh members who were who were communicating with people in the mob that you know people that were you know giving away locations of of members in the in the capital and in in capital buildings um that hasn't come out yet and so i think doing that and like not not you know falling to the tendency to just move on to the next news cycle is going to be really important um that might <laughs> that might be helped by with your idea of bringing up media monopolies because obviously everyone is is already is already moving on but um that and then also i mean there are resolutions in congress right now looking to hold accountable members who were involved in this and so um you know taking those seriously paying attention to those seeing if there's activity on that and who's who's supporting that and who isn't i think will be really important in the in the coming weeks also particularly Cory Bush's resolution I'm thinking of right. um, to remove certain members. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, ju- I'll jump in here. Um, I think that there's actually a lot that can be done. There's some really, there's an, a really amazing report in the Los Angeles Times today that talks about the connection between what happened and uh, Amon Bundy, who's been 
marshalling and organizing extremists for for years. It, it, some people may remember about four years ago, he took over uh, a national park for an extended period of time uh, with with a lot of weapons. He's now organizing a huge movement called the People's Rights Movement, where he's trying to be able to produce, you know, a, a thousand um, essentially armed extremists uh, on call at any point. So I think the one thing you have to look at to try to prevent this is not just sort of the physical security around the Capitol, which as someone who lives right near the Capitol, I think is probably gone overboard, uh, create, you know, you're essentially living in a security state now and start looking at the, the structures and the organizations that are out there still planning today for more of this kind of activity. Um, and so that's what I'd like to, to see happen. I think that's, that's what could potentially, you know, prevent something like this from happening in the future. It's interesting you say that because we had Tom Hartman at the top of the show and he was discussing uh, just his new book that's out. Um, and if you're not an oligarchy, I mean, if you're not a democracy, uh, the oligarchy and democracy, the, the, the shift between the two and how oligarchies always come with a security state. Uh, and I just find it fascinating that the response to an eruption <laughs> at the Capitol is more security state, bigger Patriot Act, uh, more police rather than what you're discussing, Judd, which is getting to some of these root issues, which are are well past due. And hopefully we can end the filibuster to get some of uh, the bigger stuff passed um, as well as, you know, taking on the, the big business that's infected every single aspect of our government. Uh, Judd Lugum, Kayla Lacey, welcome back. Thanks for joining us today on this lovely Tuesday. Um, we hope to have you back on soon. And I'm going to do some shout outs to our chat because we've got a bunch of them. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us. All right. We have Fadi Anton saying, you just don't get this type of conversation anywhere, anywhere else. Always unique insights on TNS. Thank you, Fadi. That's very sweet. Prairie Fire Kowalski from Nebraska, who we spoke to earlier today at the Majority Report. Thanks for the love. Thank you to Professor Harvey K, who's mixing it up in the live chat on YouTube and Twitch. I don't know how he does it. Does he have two platforms open? He probably does. That's that's some multitasking. Uh, and of course, Midi Docs, Midi Doctor is working that algorithm along with Mario Q. We are so grateful to you. Uh, I heard your shout out today on Majority Report as well. I was like, oh, Midi Docs, love the family. And as always, thank you to our moderators, Bob Choken, the Orb, and Chuck Diesel on YouTube. And Dorian Sap Sapiens, a difficult truth and nug wrangler on Twitch for keeping that chat room troll free. We are so grateful to you. We will see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. And to everybody on Patreon, we are extremely grateful to you as well. All right. Take care, everybody, and stay in solidarity. <laughs>